This is a UNCG Pedagogical Poetry Society video, and I'm Abby Bryan. Today we're going to be talking about narrative poetry. I'll start with a quick definition and a very brief history of narrative poetry, and then I'll provide some practical examples of how you can teach narrative poetry in your classroom. Narrative poetry is one of three major poetic genres, the other two being dramatic poetry and lyric poetry. Simply defined, narrative poetry tells a story through verse. Like prose narratives, such as novels or short stories, narrative poems have a plot, characters, and setting. They lay out a series of events, often including action and dialogue, in a way that gestures at the significance of these events, emphasizes their affect, or invites interpretation. Of course, however, narrative poems differ from their prose cousins in form as they frame the act of storytelling in the rhythmically and sonically constructed language of verse. Historically speaking, narrative poetry derives from the oral tradition, in which stories were presented for an audience by a speaker who had committed the story to memory. Poetic elements such as rhythm and rhyme and repetition made these early narrative poems easier to memorize, recite, and ultimately pass down through generations. Some of the most foundational and canonical literary works from many cultures are narrative poems. The Mesopotamian Epic of Gilgamesh, the ancient Greek epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Old English Anglo-Saxon epic, Beowulf are just a few well-known and also well-studied examples of this poetic form. In fact, most poems before the 19th century and a lot since then have been narrative poems. This is to say, the range of narrative poetry is immense. It includes the entire epic tradition, as well as medieval and early modern verse romances and folk ballads. So what is it about this genre of poetry that has made it so enduring? Some theoreticians say it's because we make sense of the world we live in through narrative. Stories help us come to terms with the events that we encounter, whether they're comic or tragic. Or perhaps even more simply, the narrative poem inspires delight. As the American poet Mary Oliver says, when we listen to the narrative poem, we're comfortable. Engaged and at times entranced, we could listen for hours. We do not love anything more deeply than we love a story. In this next section, I'm going to offer up some practical tips for teaching this type of poem in your classroom. We'll look at a specific E.E. E. Cummings poem. Stay tuned. I love teaching narrative poems because they help get at big, complex questions about the purpose of poetry and storytelling. Big questions like, why would a poet choose to tell a story through verse? Why not just tell a story directly? What does a poetic form do for a story? And what's lost when we take away a narrative poem's poetic structures? In this video, we're going to talk about strategies for teaching E.E. E. Cummings' poem in just since it's a really incredible text for getting students thinking and talking about these big questions. Although we'll focus our attention on Cummings' poem specifically, the strategies I'll suggest for teaching this poem could be applied to other narrative poems as well. Some other examples of poems that work well as inference points to narrative poetry can also be found in the links included with this video. Okay, so let's dive into Injust. If you're familiar with this poem, you'll know that it includes very little punctuation and some really playful and interesting uses of spacing. So for these reasons, this poem gives us a ton of fodder for conversations with students about how poetic forms can shape narratives. But before we look at the poem as Cummings originally wrote it, I like to introduce it to students in a more cleaned up form with traditional spacing, stanzas, and capitalization, like this. Then, once we've discussed the cleaned up version, I like to reveal the real version, the one Cummings actually wrote. This reveal helps students to visualize and internalize just how many active and careful choices down to spacing and punctuation poets make in composing a poem, choices that ultimately influence our reading and experience of the poem. But we'll get to that reveal in just a little bit. For now, with this cleaned up version of Injust in front of students, I like to begin by giving a bit of context for the poem, sharing a few details to help students to visualize what's happening. The key to teaching narrative poetry is finding ways to bring narrative poems to life with students. 
our goal is for students to not only be able to picture the world of the poem, but to actually feel like they can inhabit it. In some cases, it can even be helpful to provide visuals of the setting and context. This is a particularly helpful strategy if you're working with a denser poem and is generally recommended for teachers of narrative poetry in ESOL classes. So what's the context for Ingest? Well, there's not a ton of context setting that needs to be done for this poem, but it is worth noting that the poem finds us outside during the springtime. The poem is full of imagery, and so it invites us to see and feel the events that are taking place during this particular spring. So once we've set the context, it's time to read the poem aloud. This strategy, too, supports in bringing the poem to life. In Just by E.E. E. Cummings In just spring, when the world is mud luscious, the little lame balloon man whistles far and wee. And Eddie and Bill come running from marbles and piracies, and it's spring, and the world is puddle wonderful. The queer old balloon man whistles far and wee, and Betty and Isbel come dancing from hopscotch and jump rope, and it's spring, and the goat footed balloon man whistles far and wee. Often, when we teach other types of narratives, such as novels or short stories, we begin by asking plot level questions about what's going on in the story to help students get a basic grasp of the narrative arc. When it comes to teaching narrative poems, it's similarly helpful to begin by making sure students have a firm grasp of the plot. While you can certainly have students tease out the poem's plot yourself, I recommend simply giving a quick 30-second paraphrase of the plot to students. Although it might feel like cheating to simply give students an overview of the plot, doing so really just makes it possible for you to spend more time discussing those big and interesting questions. So to paraphrase in just, what we have is something kind of like this. During a muddy springtime, a balloon man whistles and two children, who have been playing outside, stop playing and come running. When puddles form on the ground, again the balloon man whistles, and two other children, Betty and Isabel, who have also been playing outside, come dancing. The balloon man is goat-footed. The poem concludes with the balloon man continuing to whistle. After offering up this paraphrase, I move students into a discussion of the poem's formal elements, and we explore how these formal elements shape the poem's narrative. Of course, there's not a ton to talk about here since we've modified the poem from its original form, but a few points of interest remain in this modified version. First is the descriptor goat-footed, used to describe the balloon man. This descriptor is very much an allusion to Greek mythology and the ancient Greek god Pan, a pastoral god often associated with music and fertility, and classically depicted as having the body of a man and the ears, tail, legs, and horns of a goat. What do students make of this allusion in the context of the poem? Does it make the balloon man seem like a positive figure? One who's soaking in nature's bounties and seeking to share a joyful tune with the children around him? Does it position him as a symbol rather than just a character? Are we to read him as symbolizing fertility and thus calling these children towards puberty and adulthood? Or does this illusion establish the balloon man as a somewhat impish and perhaps even menacing figure, a lustful man creepily whistling at children? And then there's the repetition of the balloon man's whistling, which we're told again and again carries far and we, suggesting that the balloon man's signal to the children is insistent, far-reaching, and building in excitement. This initial discussion of the poem's use of illusion and repetition opens up a couple possible readings. Could this be a poem telling the story of the joys of springtime in the park for a musical old man and some young children? Could it be telling the story of fertility, repeatedly calling children to adulthood, and the loss of youth and innocence? Could it be a more sinister story, the tale of a predatory old man lurking in the park? It's here that I like to reveal the poem as Cummings originally wrote it, and to move towards a conversation about how the poem's original form contributes to our understanding of the narrative. Looking at the original, students quickly identify that Although the content is the same, Cummings' use of spacing and punctuation in particular bring something new to the poem. Let's consider the spacing first. Some words seem to puddle together, imitating the mud and puddles on the ground, while other words drift apart, 
mimicking the children's play as they seem to hop, skip, and jump across the page. How does the spacing impact our reading? Does the poem begin to feel more playful and innocent, or more dark and sinister? Your class can discuss. And then there's the unusually sparse punctuation. There are no commas or periods. The lines bound on and on. In fact, the poem ends without any closing punctuation at all. It feels left open and unresolved, suggesting that the possibilities of what will happen next are just as limitless as the poem's form. What else do students make of the sparse punctuation and free-flowing language? How does the punctuation play into their reading of the narrative? The possibility for different readings here ultimately stirs up a rich discussion that, to me, is even more interesting than attempting to arrive at a single definitive interpretation. It's here that you can discuss with students, are all of these readings of the poem's narrative equally plausible? Can they all coexist? Do the poem's formal elements support one reading more than another? And from here, how would the poem be different if Cummings had packaged the narrative as a short story? What would be lost? What does the poem accomplish here with its use of illusion, repetition, spacing, and punctuation that might not be accomplished through a prose narrative? This approach to teaching narrative poetry works well to unveil some of the layered ways in which a narrative poem's formal elements can shape its story and help students begin thinking about how narrative poems work. For additional narrative poems that work well for teaching, check out the links below. Thanks so much for watching.